Good evening. Happy Ash Wednesday to you. We are having a, uh, this is a special service that starts the season of Lent. Uh, Lent is this uh, time of 40 days that happens between uh, Ash Wednesday and Easter Sunday, where we take time to consider what our relationship with God is and what our relationship with one another is. Uh, it's a time for us to reflect. It's a time for us to prepare. It's a time for us to reorient ourselves in a way that is helpful, in a way that, that helps us to really understand our value in Christ, not to diminish ourselves, but to take on the eyes of God and see ourselves in a new way. We're going to talk about that a little bit this evening, but we're glad that you're here and we hope that we can uh, take some time to worship. So thank you for joining us. Let's worship God together. Oh, the vapor of it all It's a chasing of the wind A substance of the form So pale and thin Let the veil of the earth Be stretched again Please join with me in the prayers of the people. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty God, in Christ you taught us to pray and promised that we would receive all that we ask in his name. 
Hear now our prayers for the church universal, for this congregation, its mission and ministry, for the healing of the earth, for peace and justice in the world, for nations and leaders, for our local community, for the poor and the oppressed, for the bereaved and lonely, for all who need healing. Guide us, O God, by your Holy Spirit, that all of our prayers and all of our lives may serve your will and show your love through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us how to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The gospel reading for this evening comes from the gospel of Matthew, chapter 6, verses 1 through 6 and 16 through 21. Listen to the word of the Lord. Be careful that you don't practice your religion in front of people to draw their attention. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Whenever you give to the poor, don't blow your trumpet as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets so that they may get praise from people. I assure you that that's the only reward they'll get. But when you give to the poor, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that you may give to the poor in secret. Your Father who sees what you do in secret will reward you. When you pray, don't be like the hypocrites. They love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners so that the people will see them. I assure you, that's the only reward they'll get. But when you pray, go into your room, shut the door, and pray to your Father who is present in that secret place. Your Father sees what you do in secret and will reward you. And when you, do, when you fast, don't put on a sad face like the hypocrites. They distort their faces so that people will know they are fasting. I assure you that they have had their reward when you fast, brush your hair and wash your face. Then you won't look like you're fasting to people, but only to your Father who is present in that secret place. Your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Stop collecting treasures for your own benefit on earth, where moth and rust eat them, and where thieves break in and steal them. Instead, collect treasures for yourself in heaven, where moth and rust don't eat them, and where thieves don't break in and steal them. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Old Testament reading this evening comes from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 58, verses 1 through 12. Listen to the word of the Lord. Shout loudly. Don't hold back. Raise your voice like a trumpet. Announce to my people their crime, to the house of Jacob their sins. They seek me day after day, desiring knowledge of my ways like a nation that acted righteously, that didn't abandon their God. They ask me for righteous judgments, wanting to be close to God. Why do we fast and you don't see? Why afflict ourselves and you don't notice? Yet on your fast day, you do whatever you want and oppress all your workers. You quarrel and brawl, and then you fast. You hit each other with, violently with your fists. You shouldn't fast as you are doing today if you want to make your voice heard on high. Is this the kind of fast I choose? A day of self-affliction, of bending one's head like a reed, and of lying down in mourning clothing, clothing and ashes? Is this what you call a fast, a day acceptable to the Lord? Isn't the fast I choose releasing wicked restraints, untying the ropes of a yoke, setting free the mistreated and breaking every yoke? Isn't it sharing your bread with the hungry and bringing the homeless into your house, covering the naked with, uh, when you see them, and not hiding your own family? Then the light will break like a dawn, and you will be healed quickly. Your own righteousness will walk before you, and the Lord's glory will be your rear guard. Then you will call, and the Lord will answer. You will cry for help, and God will say, I'm here. If you remove the yoke from among you, the finger pointing, the wicked speech, if you open your heart to the hungry and provide abundantly for those who are afflicted, your light will shine in the darkness, and your gloom will be like the noon. The Lord will guide you continually and provide for you, even in parched places. He will rescue your bones. You will be like a watered, watered garden, like a spring of water that won't run dry. They will rebuild ancient ruins on your account. The foundations of generations past you will restore. You will be called mender of broken walls, restorer of livable streets. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. There is a hymn 
a modern day hymn that was written in the last, I think in the last 20 years called In Christ Alone. Uh, and it's really good. Uh, it's uh, one that we enjoy singing a lot. Uh, you'll hear it a lot in traditional churches and contemporary churches. Uh, <clears throat> it's it's the one that goes in Christ alone. Da, 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 da. Uh, it's it's very good. And um, when the PCUSA, the Presbyterian Church, uh, was creating a new hymnal, the Glory to God hymnal, the purple hymnal that we have in our pews, uh, they wanted to add this hymn, this new song, so new praise song, into uh, the hymnal. Uh, but there was one line within the hymn uh, that they didn't want to add to the hymnal. The, the In Christ Alone song was written uh, by folks who were in a different tradition, uh, theologically, and they wanted to change this one line. Uh, and this line had been changed and published in other places. And the line goes like this. Till on that cross, when Christ, he died, the wrath of God was, was satisfied. They wanted to change that to till on that cross, uh, when Christ, he died, the love of God was magnified. Uh, the writers of the song said, no, you can't change it. That's the whole purpose of the song. Uh, you cannot publish it with, if you want to use the song, you have to include the wrath of God line, uh, not the love of God line. And uh, to their credit, the PCUSA said, okay, well, we're not going to use the song. We'll come back to that. Lent, we're starting Lent today. Today is the season of Lent. It begins, it is a six week period that goes about six weeks, about five and a half weeks that goes between Ash Wednesday and Easter Sunday. It is 40 days. Those 40 days are meant to represent two things. They represent the 40 days that uh, Christ spent in the wilderness at the beginning of his um, ministry. So right after his baptism, he went into the wilderness for 40 days. And while he was there, he was tempted, uh, but then started his ministry from that point. Those 40 days are meant to represent the 40 years that the Israelites spent in the wilderness upon uh, between the exodus, the, the freedom from slavery and bondage in Egypt and their deliverance to the Holy Land, uh, the promised land uh, in, uh, in Judah, in Israel, Palestine, modern day Israel, Palestine. We tend to celebrate these 40 days primarily by giving things up by uh, denying ourselves of things it, to the point that we even have a thing called Fat Tuesday, which was yesterday, uh, which is what Mardi Gras culminates in Fat Tuesday. It's called Fat Tuesday because in uh, recognition of Lent in which we are to be sober and um, uh, d deny a lot of our greater appetites, uh, it is the last call, basically. Uh, since we're going to have to fast and be good for the next 40 days, let's be as as uh, as gluttonous as we can right now. And so Fat Tuesday was like, fill up yourself, make yourself fat on Tuesday, because on Wednesday, you're going to have to give a bunch of stuff up. And so in our modern understanding, kind of that sense of uh, Lent has been to give something up. We often give up things we love, give up ice cream or give up uh, sweets or um, certain things like that. It It is uh, denying oneself of something. The problem with that is that that's not really what Lent is about. Because we deny ourselves of things oftentimes as a, as a means of punishment, as a means of um, saying this thing that you like needs to be removed so that you can learn how to be better. Uh, even if it's not couched in that way, that's kind of how we view Lent. That's what Mardi Gras is. Mardi Gras is the fun is about to be over for the next 40 days. So let's have as much fun as we can now. And the real problem with that is that that's not why Jesus goes into the wilderness. And that's not even why the, the Israelites are there for 40 days, 40 years. Jesus doesn't go into the wilderness to punish himself or to uh, self harm or, or to uh, minimize himself. Jesus goes into the wilderness to focus, to get a mindful sense of who he is and what is coming. It's a sense of preparation. And that's what Lent is. 
even the Israelites, which it's, we can very much read that story as we often do, as they were punished by God for not being faithful. And so then God kept them in the wilderness for 40 years. Um, and there's a lot of passages that read as though that's the case, but that doesn't seem to be the reason for why uh, God wants them to be there. God is trying to help them to learn who they are, to, to understand the rationale behind what uh, happened in the Exodus and the relationship that God wants to have with them. Out of this time in the wilderness come the Ten Commandments, but even more than that come a greater understanding of the people of <clears throat> Israel start celebrating God as their God, not just the God of their ancestors. They claim a relationship with God. God does not want to be distant from us. God wants to be close. And so those 40 years are less about making Israel pay for their lack of faithfulness and more about making them understand, helping them to understand the real nature of what God desires for them. And once they get into the promised land, what's that's going to be? Now, they screw up as soon as they get there, as we do, as soon as Easter comes. Like that, uh, the fact that we are not good at our relationship with God and our relationship with one another uh, doesn't mean that this season isn't a good one for us to practice. Lent becomes this time in that sense of reflection, of, of mental preparation, of, of a time to be mindful. In the same way that uh, as people who go on diets or or there's a thing called mindful eating. Mindful eating is less of a diet, uh, which is about an end game. The end game is I need to lose 50 pounds or I need to lose such and such. I need to fit into this dress before uh, my high school reunion. And then it becomes denying yourself something to achieve a goal. That's what a diet is. Mindful eating is a very different thing. It is being aware of what you're eating, not for the sake of a particular goal or a particular weight limit or something like that. While those can be weight loss is not a bad thing or, or being healthier is not a bad thing. It's not that you have a destination. It's about reorienting the way in which you have a relationship with food, thinking about the things that you eat and the way that they are, um, potentially even the way that they are sourced, uh, the way that they get to your, uh, table, what they do to your body, what it means to the environment. That's how we get things like fair trade coffee and, uh, and uh, kind of cage-free uh, foods and things like that, that some people have found that even mindfulness in terms of what it means to have this food provided for you helps to appreciate it better. That we, um, it may not actually change the way you look externally, but it will change the behavior and the relationship that you have to the people who made your food and the way in which your food is enjoyed. Uh, when we are mindful about the ways in which we interact with people, the ways in which we interact with the world, the ways we, our relationship with our garbage or the relationship with our uh, environment around us, the relationship with the neighbors who have moved in, who don't look like us or act like us, it changes the way that we live. The goal of, of being mindful, of being considerate, Consider, con, considering of the, the behaviors that we have is about change. And as we have talked about, the word change is another word for repent. Repent just means change. It doesn't mean stop sinning. It doesn't mean uh, get right. It doesn't mean ask for forgiveness. All of those things are part of change, can be part of change. But the whole point is saying you're going the wrong way. You need to go a better way. Being mindful is saying my relationship with the things around me uh, is perhaps not intentional. I eat the things I eat because I have always eaten the things I eat. I act the way I act because I've always acted the way that I act. I do the things that I do because that's just what I do. That's what I was taught to do and that's how I do it. There's a lot of things that we do that we don't even really think about why we do them. Why do you like the teams that you do? Why do you like the sports that you do? Why do you go to the church that you go to? Is it because you chose to go there or is it because that's what you've always done? This is a season for us to reflect on why we do the things that we do. In both of these passages, we have God criticizing fasting. Fasting just means to, to uh, take a break from something. Uh, 
and to when you break that fast, when you stop fasting, then uh, oftentimes it refers to food, then you start eating again. Literally our word breakfast means break fast. You break the fast that you had from when you went to sleep to the time you woke up. That fast, that cessation from eating uh, is broken when you start eating again. And that we can fast from food, we can fast from activities, we can fast from all sorts of things. And fasting is not for the sake of denying oneself, it's for the sake of considering why you're doing it. And so in both of these passages, we have uh, God saying through Isaiah, what, I don't need a religious fast, I don't need you to do all of these things to, to get people to notice how important, how religious you are. I don't want you to roll around on the ground and rub dirt on your face. There's all kinds of interesting ways in which people would fast, would show their, their piety and their religious uh, conviction by doing these external physical things so that someone say, look at how, how religious this person is. Um, we even have a, a, a mirror of this in the action of, of getting ashes at Ash Wednesday, which is a wonderful thing to do but it's a small sign of knowing that we come from ash, but it has connections to in times when people would take dirt and rub it all over their face to say, I am worthless. That is not what we're trying to do. We are not trying to say you are worthless. You are no more worth than dirt or ashes. We are saying that God has a purpose for us that is bigger than our mere existence, that we have been created that we have a purpose and our purpose is not uh, this corporeal world in which we gain status and, and admiration and approval from one another. It's for something bigger than this. And it's not to dismiss this world, but it's to say that the achievements that we get uh, will eventually fade away. But the ways in which we affect others, the ways in which we, the, the legacy that we leave in terms of love is what transcends all of this. And so as we look at some of these things and what God is saying that, uh, that this notion of, of fasting as a showy attention grabbing thing of saying, look at how much I'm suffering. Uh, that misses the point. Lent is not about suffering. Fasting is not about suffering. And when we put it about that, we, we get distracted from what it really is about. If we look at the cross, if we look at the cross, uh, oftentimes the first thing that many of us see is suffering, uh, especially if you've grown up in traditions where there is a crucifix, where there literally is a crucified Christ on the cross. The first thing you notice is suffering. And so for many of us, when we look at the cross, we see suffering and that affects the way we see God because the main icon that we have of our connection to God is the cross. And if you look at the cross and see the cost that it takes the suffering that was had as this the worst possible suffering that could have happened, then we are in debt to God. We are, we see that that should have been us and it wasn't. And so we owe God, which is not inherently a bad thing, but that's not the relationship that God wants for us. What the cross is, is less a debt that God has paid for us, that God is now keeping account of, but rather a gift that God has given us. What God wants us to see and what God is, is, is constantly saying through Christ and through, uh, throughout scripture is that when we look to the cross, when we look to what God has done for us, we shouldn't see suffering first and foremost. We should see love. We should see a God who is so desperate to connect to us, who loves us so much that, that God is willing to die for us. And that our response to that love should be love. Because if all we see is suffering, our response to that suffering is guilt. Is uh, a debt that must be repaid. Then our response to God is out of that sense of guilt, out of that sense of obligation, out of that sense of fear that we can never repay the debt that has been incurred. When we look at the cross and we see the wrath of God being satisfied, we see a God who is defined by wrath, a wrath that has to be satisfied, a wrath and anger uh, that is, must be quenched before that relationship can exist. And that is not the God that we're told of, particularly through Christ. 
What we're told very plainly is that God is not wrath, but that God is love. And so when we look to the cross and we see the love of God magnified, it affects the way we respond to God. That we respond not out of guilt, but out of gratitude, not out of obligation, but out of opportunity. That when God asks us to love one another, that that love looks like caring and providing opportunity, providing things that that person needs so that they would live, rather than providing judgment to help that person see the cost that they have incurred and what they must do to fulfill those obligations to a God who desires, who, who must be satisfied, whose wrath must be quenched before we can be right. That's not a good God. That's like a, a bookie. That is like someone who has a, a debt over our heads that must be fulfilled so that we can live in peace. And that is not the story of the gospel. When we see this gift of love on the cross, we are free to love God without the fear of obligation, without the fear of, of the guilt that God has given, or that God, uh, that, that the cost of a debt incurs upon us. The love of God is a gift. It is not an obligation. It is not a debt. It is offered freely by a God who loves us so much that the whole point of that action is to remove the guilt, to remove the obligation, to remove the sense that we are terrible garbage ash people and that we need to strip ourselves down of any pleasure so that we can experience the suffering that helps us to relate to a suffering Christ on the cross. That's not what the story is. That's not what Lent is most uh, is supposed to parallel. It's supposed to parallel a Christ who goes into this ministry of love by preparing for it, by mindfully knowing what the temptations out there are. The temptations that the devil gives are good things. You should eat this food because food is good. And Jesus denies the food not to say that food is bad, but to say that I'm not here to help myself. I'm here to, to focus on God and to rely on God. I'm not here to gain glory to myself as the devil tempts him to, to throw himself down so that the angels would save him. I'm not here to test God. I'm not here to challenge God's love for me because I trust God's love for me. I'm not afraid that maybe God won't save me because I haven't been good enough. And even that dominion over the earth that, that Jesus is tempted with at the end, that the, the challenge is I don't need that because I don't need the recognition of this worldly kingdom. My love, my power comes from the only true power, which is a God who loves us. When we put guilt in the way of love, our eyes are taken off of love and then we can, our, it separates us from one another because guilt is measured out in, in cost, in debt. And if we can start to pay off that debt, that means that others have not paid the debt as much as us. That means that we separate ourselves from others who aren't trying to pay off that debt. And then we start to think of ourselves as better than them. And we start to be less willing to help those people who haven't worked on their debt who seem to be uh, not as holy as we are, who don't cover their faces in ashes, who don't weep and rend their clothes at the sins of the world, who don't pray every day, who don't offer these big sacrifices in front of everybody or say these big glorious prayers that Jesus warns us against in this passage. The point of loving God is not to prove to other people how holy you are. It is to show that you are free to love others. The fast that God wants from us is not this holy action of denial or of debt repayment or of guilt. It is to help others. When we love God, we can then love others. Lent is a time for us to be mindful about our relationship with God. It's a time for us to actively choose God, to choose 
love. We are in a world where there's so much opportunity for love. There are so many places where people need help. There are so many places when we need help. When we need community, we need others around us who will help us, not by judging us, not by assessing our guilt, by illuminating our debt, but by expressing the gift that God has had given each of us that sets us free, not only from fear of death, but from fear of life. Let us not see Lent as a time to learn how to hate ourselves, but let us see Lent as an opportunity to choose God, a God who has already chosen us, a God who loves us, a God who loves others, and a God who desires that we would love one another the way that God loves us. Let us look to the cross of Easter, to the cross of Good Friday, the cross with the Christ who dies, but let us not see the wrath of God on that cross. Let us see the love of God that is magnified. We've got 40 days, but even more than that, we've got our whole lives. Let us be people who reflect a God who is good, not a God who is wrath. Let us be people who reflect who a God, uh, reflect a God who has hope, not a God who has judgment. Let us be people of love and not of hate. Amen. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Come and let your glory come and let your glory fall. Our Father who art in heaven, the rocks cry out your fame. Come and let your glory come and let your glory fall. I will sing, sing a new song. I will sing, sing a new song. I will sing, sing a new song to the Lord. Let your kingdom come, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven every heart proclaim the mercy of your name on earth as it is in heaven god give us every new morning mercy is daily bread in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus we pray. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us with your hand. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus we pray. Father, we pray, I will sing, sing a new song, I will sing. Sing a new song, I will sing, sing a new song to the Lord. Let your kingdom come, let your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Every heart proclaim mercy of your name, on earth as it is in heaven. For the kingdom is yours, and the power is yours, and the glory forever, amen. And the kingdom is yours, and the power is yours, and the glory forever, amen. Let your kingdom come, let your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. 
Every heart proclaim mercy of your name on earth as it is in heaven. So now it's time for us to go. It's time for us to leave this place, to go back into the world uh, around us, to go back to our regularly scheduled lives and to the things that God has put in our lives for this evening, uh, to be present with the people that God has put in our lives and to experience the things that we need to experience. Let's get the rest that we need so that we'll be ready for the rest of the week and for this whole season of Lent. But more than anything, let us know that God loves us, that God loves others, and God invites us to participate in that love that God has for the world. Let us go from this place, not bringing God to the world, but bearing witness to a God and following God into a world in which God is alive and active, helping others to see God in all that we say and do and in the world around them. Let us be people who magnify the love of God. Let us be people who see that God is good all the time and that all the time God is good. So let's go. And as you go, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the communion and fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Amen. Have a good week. We'll see you Sunday. Uh, enjoy this season of Lent. Uh, find ways to let it be a hopeful and um, illuminating and enjoyable time. A time when we can focus on uh, our relationship with God in new ways because this is an opportunity to start over. Let's do it together. See you soon.